for this next chapter, um, we're going to combine chapters 10 and 11. Um, chapter 10 we'll pretty much get through in one day. Okay, It's not very long. It's not very complex. Um, but we're going to talk about two main concepts uh, in science and in physics um, that are work and energy. And work takes on a whole new definition when we talk about the physics definition of work. Um, but energy is one of the most, like maybe the main concept in science, and so we're going to look at how it applies um, to the physical world, and we're going to look at the conservation of energy, all that kind of stuff. Um, but two main topics today. Okay, so this chapter we're going to look at energy, um, and we've already looked at momentum, right? What was the main equation for momentum? Does anyone remember? P equals... MV, good, okay, momentum equals mass times velocity. Um, we're also going to look at energy now. So we've looked at momentum, and we knew that it was conserved. Energy will also be conserved. What does it mean for a quantity um, to be conserved? What does that mean? Yeah, the amount of energy stays the same. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the out amount of... All right, um, so conservation means that it's not created or destroyed. So when we talk about energy, it might not be necessarily just the energy of one thing doesn't change, but it means the energy of the whole system is not changing. So what's it called when um, energy is like changing forms? Or where do we see energy um, taking a change in form? Okay, first of all, think about some different types of energy. What types of energy might we look at? Heat is one. Light is one. What was the other one? Mechanical. Mechanical. What's the last big one? When you plug something in. Electrical. Electrical. Okay. Um, we're really going to basically um, stick with what we call mechanical energy, which is kind of the total overall energy of the system. But I want you to think about energy in terms of a transfer. So if we turn on a light bulb, what type of energy does that give you right off the bat? Light energy. Okay. And as that light is being emitted, does it transform or uh, um, emit another type of energy? Heat. Heat, yeah, right. When a light bulb gets hot, right, that's a transfer of energy. So we look at energy within the system just being transferred. It's not being lost or gained. It's just having a transfer there, okay? So energy and work, which is what we're going to cover in chapters 10 and 11, they're both scalar quantities. So what does that mean when something is scalar? It's kind of the opposite of a vector. They were the counterpart to a vector. Yeah, good. No direct. Okay. We might include a negative here to show that it's going in the downward direction, but it's not required. Okay. It's not like velocity where we have to absolutely tell them north, south, east, west. Um, but you, you might see problems in which you have um, work done by gravity, which means we might have a negative um, quantity there, but it's not 100% required. Okay? So scalar. They don't have direction. Um, some things that are the opposite of a scalar, what's that called, right? If something's like the other version of a scalar is a vector, it has to have direction. So force, acceleration, what are other couple um, vectors that we learned about, vector quantities? Acceleration, force, what were the first couple? Velocity and one more. Not direction, but displacement. 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 That's the vector quantity of distance. Okay? So here's our definition for work. Okay, our definition of work is the product of the displacement times the force that's parallel to that displacement. And I will explain that parallel part here in just a second. But essentially what you can think of it as work is the force applied times the distance that that force is being applied. Okay, so force times displacement. Okay, so this parallel component says it must be a, the force that is applied parallel to the displacement. And so sometimes you might see it written like this, force parallel. Okay, and okay, this literally just means the force that is parallel to the displacement that's happening. Okay, and I'll show you kind of what that means here in a, in a diagram. But the, the force that is parallel to the displacement, that means I can't apply a force horizontally and the object move vertically and have any work being done. Okay, you have to make sure that those two are in line. Okay, so let's look at this um, diagram here. Parallel is the component of the constant force that's parallel to the displacement. So in this case, our displacement is horizontal or vertical? 
horizontal, right? It says it's moving from here to here, okay? But we're pulling it with some diagonal force, right? We're dragging this box on the ground. Can we envision what's happening here? We're dragging something or pulling something um, from this diagonal type motion or this diagonal force. But our displacement is purely horizontal. It's not moving diagonally up the ramp or anything. It's just moving horizontally. So we're just dragging this thing. So that means the only force that we can use in this work equation, work equals force times displacement. Since our displacement is purely in the x direction, we can only look at the x component of that force. Okay, that's what that means. The force that we're using has to be parallel to the displacement. So in order to find the parallel or the x component here, we would take force times cosine of theta because cosine would be the adjacent, the x side. Okay, does that kind of make sense? If our triangle looked differently, okay, for x, we're almost going to always use the cosine. Um, if we have an angle that looks like this, uh, then it would maybe be a little different, but most of the time we're going to have pretty simple angles which would allow us to use cosine to find the x, dis x force and sine to use the y force, okay, most of the time. But you just have to look at your triangle. You guys know how to solve triangles just fine. If I push a loaded grocery cart a distance of 50 meters by exerting a horizontal force, 30 newtons on the cart, how much work would be done on the cart? So as I push my shopping cart, what's the displacement going to be? Does, it, does the car go vertical or horizontal or what? It would be horizontal, right? We don't push the shopping cart and it goes vertically. Okay, so here's my cart. It's going 50 meters. And I'm applying a force horizontally, 30 newtons. Are these two things parallel to each other? 30 and 50? Yeah, both purely horizontal. So that means when I'm solving for work, I would say work equals force times displacement. So it's 30 times 50. Okay, and if I took these um, two units and multiplied them by each other, what would my units come out to be? Newtons times meters. Should give me Newton meters. Okay. Any questions there? Pretty simple, right? Okay. Um, the unit for work, or a newton meter, is called a joule. Joule. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was just explaining how we did that. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. All right, so the unit for work, which is always just a capital W, is labeled with a capital J, which is joules. Okay, have you heard that unit before? Yeah. Maybe in college can? Okay, joules. Um, joules is an energy unit, a heat unit, a work unit. It's used for lots of different things, um, but it's, yeah, what we're going to use for work. Okay, so one joule is equal to one newton meter. I'm going to give you about two or three minutes to think about these questions and talk about them, and then we are going to address um, the answers. Can a force be exerted on an object, yet no work be done? What work is done on an object that is carried as you walk at constant velocity? Okay, so go ahead and take a couple minutes with the partner next to you and discuss, and we will see what we come up with. Can a force be exerted on an object, yet no work be done? Is that true or false? True. That's true. That's true. A force on an object can be exerted, yet no work be done. That is true. So the answer to that is yes. Okay, can we think of an example? You're pulling up on something? 
Doesn't have displacement? Yeah, good. Okay, so if I exert a force on an object and it doesn't move, that means no work is being done. Does it feel like you're exerting work? Okay, what makes you say none? Because to have force, you have to have acceleration. Mm, right? Not necessarily. You're on the right track. Okay, and we're going to look at these in the next couple problems. But when we solve for work, we have to be thinking about are we looking at the net work of the system? Are we looking at the work done on an object or the work done by an object? Okay, so those are two things that we needed to take into account. Are we looking at work by a specific force? Are we looking at network? Or are we looking at the work done by an object or on an object? So you have to be specific about those things. Um, take a second to get what you want to written down, and then I will explain that a little bit more. A crate is pulled 40 meters along a horizontal floor by a force of 100 newtons, exerted at 37 degrees. The floor exerts a frictional force of 50 newtons. Determine the work done on the crate. Okay, this big long arrow here, this force arrow, that's really not a force. It's just kind of showing us that it's going to end up at that second spot. Okay, so that's not part of our free body diagram. Okay, so here, since it doesn't ask for the work done by the applied or the work done by friction, we're going to look for the net work that's being done here on the crate. Okay, we want to find the overall. All right, and there's two ways that we can go about solving for them. I'm going to show you both ways, um, but I'll show you kind of which one I think is simpler. But I'll show you both. Okay. Since our displacement here is horizontal... I need what component of my applied force? I need the x, the horizontal component. So I only need this side. Okay? And so to find that, I would take the hypotenuse times cosine of theta. Make sure that your calculator is in degrees, not radians. Okay, and that gives me what value for my x component? 79. Yeah, good. 79.8, 79.9, um, somewhere in that region. Okay, so I'm going to show you the first way to do this, which would be to find the net force. Okay, because in order to find the work, we want to take work equals force times displacement. Here, we're going to make sure that this is the net force when we plug that in. Okay. So to find net force, I would take positives minus negatives, and I'm only concerned about which axes here, the horizontal or the vertical? The horizontal. Okay, so to positives minus negatives, that means my F net would equal 79.9 minus the frictional force, which was 50, which would give me a positive net force of 29.9 newtons. Okay. If my applied component, my x component, wasn't greater than 50, what would happen to my box? It wouldn't move, right? If my frictional force was greater than my applied, it wouldn't move. So that's good that we have a positive net force. So in order to do that, we would, to order to find work after that, we would take work equals net force times the displacement. And remember, work as in jewels. All right, and I'm going to quickly show you the alternate way to do that, which is very similar, but works either way. Okay, and the way we would do that is we would find the work done by the applied force by taking 79.9 times 40. Right, this would be force applied 
or force X times displacement. Okay, and we would find the work done by friction. And we'd take our frictional force times our displacement because the frictional force is still applied over that whole 40 meters, which was 2,000 joules. Okay, so to find our net work or our overall, we would take positives minus negatives. Okay, and those two values are the same. Okay, so it makes no difference the way you want to do that. Okay, algebraically it works out the same. Um, conceptually it should work out the same. We're just thinking about the net force or the different types of work. Okay, does that make sense? I usually will go with this method. Okay, go with the net force. I think that's a little simpler and you're just doing one little less step in math kind of. But. Okay, either way will work just fine. Any questions there? Just looking at the work done by the hiker. Right, we're looking at the work done by the hiker on the backpack. We're not really concerned with anything else. Okay, so not at this point we're not looking for the net work on the backpack. We're just looking at the work that's done by the hiker to do that. Okay, so here's the hill that he's carrying up. Here's our backpack. It ends up at the top of the hill up here. Do we care what this what this length of the slope was? how far he walked, okay? So let's think about this. What kind of force is he exerting on this backpack to keep it on his back? What type of force is he exerting to hold or carry that backpack? Mm, no. Okay, simpler, vertical or horizontal? Vertical. vertical. He's exerting a vertical force to keep it on his shoulders, right? He is having to lift that thing. So since our force that's being applied is purely vertical, that means what type of displacement do we care about? Do we care about the angle or do we care about just the height of the hill? Just the height. Just the height. We just care about how far it's going to be above where it started. Okay, that's it. Okay? But, so let's think about this. If we know that we're going to take into account the force of the hiker times the displacement or the vertical height, work is equal to force times displacement, how do we find the force that he's applying? Okay, think about that backpack on his back. Okay, how much force is he having to apply to make sure that it stays on his back and it doesn't fall to the ground? Yeah, more or just as much as gravity, right? That backpack, is it accelerating on his back? Right? Is it moving up and down on his back? No, it's staying stationary on his back. So that means the force that he's applying, it could be a tension force, right? It could be a lifting force, doesn't really matter. But the force that he's applying is just enough to overcome gravity, which means these two forces have to be equal to each other. Okay, so the force that he's applying on that backpack to keep it on his back has to be equal to gravity. So we could find that by taking mass times what? 9.8. Okay, so this method that we're doing is kind of like that second method I showed you. We're going to find the work done by each type of force, and then we're going to put it together with the net work. Okay, so 15 times 9.8 is 147. That's the force that the hiker is applying to keep that thing on his back. We'll take that times our displacement, which we said was a vertical 10 meters. Okay, 1,470 joules. So this is just the work done by the hiker. That's it. Okay, it's not the network on the system. It's just the work that the hiker himself is doing. Gravity only. Okay? Find the work just done by gravity. And this is pretty simple, right? It's pretty similar to what we just did. So if we know that these two forces are equal to each other, right, we already said those two forces are equal to each other, what does F sub G have to be equal to? Yeah, 147. It's still 15 times 9.8. Okay, we already said these two things are equal to each other. Doesn't gravity work the whole time that he is hiking up that 10-meter hill? 
Yes, so that means our work is still going to be 147 times 10, 1470 joules. So gravity is doing just enough work, right? We said the man was climbing at constant velocity, so he's climbing just enough to overcome gravity, right? Just fast enough um, to overcome gravity as he's moving up that hill. So gravity does the same amount of work as this hiker does to keep this backpack off the ground. Okay, so what does that mean that the net work of our system is going to be? What's the overall net work done Zero. on our backpack? Right, if we take F net equals positives minus negatives, okay, our right, um, work done by the hiker minus work done by gravity, it will be 1470 minus 1470 which is zero joules. Okay, so the hiker feels like he's doing work, and he is. He's doing 1470 joules worth, worth of work, but gravity's doing just as much. So the backpack itself has zero joules of work being done on it. Okay, and so energy is one of the most important concepts that we'll cover in science, um, in any of your science classes. Um, but we're going to hit on two main types of energy. Okay, um, can anyone... Think about different types of energy, not like the mechanical or um, electrical types of energy, but I'm talking um, a little bit more. Kinetic. Yeah, good, kinetic. Kinetic is one, good one. Um, and potential is the other. Very good, kinetic and potential. Um, so when we talk about kinetic and potential energy, we're talking about translational kinetic and potential energy, and translational just means that these things aren't spinning or rotating. We're moving pretty simply from point A to point B, okay, because when things start to spin and rotate, it takes a little different um, energy and takes on some different characteristics, but we're just talking about things moving pretty simply from point A to point B, okay? So translational, kinetic, and potential energy. Okay, and the reason that energy and work go so closely together is because energy is the ability of an object to do work. Okay, energy is the ability of an object to do work. If it has or contains energy, it has the ability to do work on an object or it has the ability to have work done on itself. Okay, and hopefully that will make a little bit more sense when we start talking about these types of energy um, put together. Okay, so the ability to do work is energy. First type we're going to talk about is kinetic. So what does kina mean or kinetic or kinematics? What does that root mean? Motion. Good, motion. Okay, so kinetic energy is the energy of an object in motion. Okay, it has to be in motion for an object to have kinetic energy. Okay, kinetic energy has the ability to be transferred. So if one object is in motion and it collides with another object that's not in motion, what happens to that second one? What? Remember we talked about this in our momentum chapter. Um, if I have an object that's moving and it collides with one at rest, what happens to this second guy? Yeah, it takes the velocity of the first one, okay? So in these elastic collisions, we have a perfect conservation of energy. Anytime it's perfectly elastic, we'll see an object transfer all of its kinetic energy, therefore all of its momentum, to that second object. It could happen also if these two things were in motion um, already. They're still going to transfer velocities. But if we have a perfectly elastic collision, we have a perfect transfer of kinetic energy, which means nothing is lost or gained. Okay. When an object exerts a force on another, the second is moved a distance, then work has been done. So that's another example in that collision equation. One is moving, it applies a force on the other, okay, which moves at a distance. That means that work has been done or kinetic energy has been transferred. All of these topics will come together here in, in an equation pretty soon. But here's our equation for kinetic energy. Okay, this is a big one. should go on your equation sheet.
You don't need that last bullet. The unit for kinetic energy will be joules. Okay, energy and work both have joules as their unit, so capital J. Just briefly on this last slide, when something collides or applies a force on an object and makes that object move, a certain displacement, that means there's been a transfer of kinetic energy, there's been a change in kinetic energy, and there's also work that has been done, right? If we apply a force and we move that object a certain distance, that's the definition of work, right? Force times distance or force times displacement. So this equation allows us to connect work and energy now, okay? So work is, is force times displacement, but it's also in general a transfer or a change in energy, okay? So the network is also going to always going to be equal to change in kinetic energy. And what's that delta symbol mean for us? Change in, good, or what minus what? Good, final minus initial. Okay, so the two and the one just mean second minus first or final minus initial. You can put an, an F and an I for final minus initial. Um, that's totally fine. Okay. Network is equal to change in kinetic energy. You don't have to rewrite that bullet. You just need to understand what the equation is telling us. This equation right here is called the work energy principle. Okay, really original, right? Work and energy combined into one equation. It's called the work energy principle. Okay, so I want you to write in here on, in your notes, okay, you don't have to write this bullet, but I want you to put work is equal to a change in energy. Okay, pretty good. Okay, and it can be kinetic, it can be potential, but that's what work means. It's a change or a transfer of energy. Okay, this equation should go on your equation sheet. Probably the top one. If you want to write it out all the way, um, work is equal to 1 half mv squared minus 1 half mv squared. You could do that too up to you. Okay, this would be final and this would be initial. Okay. One version of those equations should go on your equation sheet. Okay, these bullets, I want to talk through them a little bit. You don't have to have them written down. Um, but I'm going to explain this work energy principle just a little bit more. So work energy principle tells us that if we have a positive net work. Okay, so let's think about that equation that I just gave you. Final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy. If that comes out to be positive, what does that mean in terms of our kinetic energy change? What has happened to our kinetic energy? Have we increased kinetic energy or decreased kinetic energy? Think of, look at that equation I just gave you. If my net work comes out to be positive, so if I get a positive answer, does that mean I've increased kinetic energy or decreased? Increased, right? Because it's final minus initial. So if I have a positive net work, that means that my kinetic energy has increased, which means I've gotten faster, okay? Because the mass isn't going to change. The one half is just part of the equation. The only thing that could change for us is the velocity. So that means my speed has increased. Okay? If I do negative net work, what does that mean happen to my speed or to my kinetic energy? Decrease. It decreased. And if my net work is zero, if I have no work that's being done on the object, what does that mean about my velocity? It stayed the same. Good, I had no change in energy. Uh, it also could mean that I'm not in motion at all. Right? Either way. All right, it's measured in joules. We just talked about that in its scalar. All right, let's try one here. So a baseball is thrown with a speed of 25 meters per second. What's its kinetic energy? So this is the first part of the question. This one kind of has two parts. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, good catch. Okay. First thing we should be seeing there is that mass is in grams, which we don't like. Okay, so we'll need to convert that to kilograms, which means we would divide by 1,000 or multiply by 1,000. Divide. divide, good. So that would make it 0. 0.145 kilograms. So the first part of our question just simply asks us for the kinetic energy. Okay, so I would say kinetic energy... is equal to one-half mv squared. Okay, a lot of you will forget this squared, I'm just telling you. Okay, so point that out on your equation sheet. Make sure you, like, you know, really go over that square so you don't forget it. Um, but I ended up with, um, Matt, what'd you have? 90.65. Uh, did you forget the one half? Okay, because I had about exactly half that. Okay, uh, Maddie, what'd you have? Yeah. 45.3 joules, okay? Did you get it to come out, Matt? Okay. All right, so 45.3 joules is the amount of kinetic energy that ball has when it's moving 25 meters per second. If it slowed down, would it have the same amount of kinetic energy? No. If it sped up, not the same amount. So it's not like it might have the same amount of kinetic energy the whole pitch, right? It's only when it's moving 25 meters per second it would have that. Okay, so second part, how much work was done on the ball to make it reach this speed if it started from rest? Okay, so that makes now this our velocity final. Our initial velocity was zero. Okay, so now we're going to plug into our work energy principle, which is change in kinetic energy, okay, which is one-half mv squared minus one-half mv <coughs> squared, right? This is initial. This is final. Okay, we already calculated that whole kinetic energy right there. Okay, we could plug it back in if we wanted to, or we could just say work equals 45.3 minus, what is the initial kinetic energy of that baseball if it starts from rest? Zero. Zero. Okay, so that means we also did 45.3 joules of work. How much work is required to accelerate a 1,000 kilogram car from 20 meters per second to 30 meters per second? All right, so let's try this one here. Work, we would take work equals one-half m times, what's our final velocity here? 20 or 30? 30. 30. So we go 30 squared minus one-half times 1,000 minus 20 squared. 